So um, welcome to the Ennery Labs uh, show. Uh, my name is Cloud Toad, a, a.k.a. Derek Winkworth. You can follow us at, um, at Ennery Labs on Twitter. Um, you can follow me at Cloud Toad, C-L-O-U-D-T-O-A-D, um, also on Twitter. And uh, today, uh, uh, we have a pretty good show, I think, ahead of us. Uh, we're doing something a little bit different um, this time around. There's two things that we're doing different, actually. Um, one is uh, we are doing this on a Thursday instead of a Monday. We have changed the time that we are doing our um, our show uh, from, from a Monday because most of our guests are busy on Monday. And uh, according to statistics and numbers and people who study these things, Thursdays are better. Uh, later in the week is better. So we're, we're going to start doing this on Thursdays instead of Mondays. Um, the same time, um, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, that would be 10 a.m. on Pacific time. Uh, but just, just doing it on Thursdays. The second thing we're doing different uh, for this particular show is that we are pre-recording it um, rather than doing it live. So uh, this is not actually being streamed on Twitch. We're just going to post, uh, As if you're watching this, you have actually clicked on it on our YouTube channel. As you know, uh, by now, we are not streaming this on Twitch. Um, Having said all that, uh, thank you for, for, for tuning in. We have a pretty good show, uh, I think, ahead of us. Uh, we have a guest, Mike Soldner, who's uh, going to, he's, uh, turns out, Mike is in Wisconsin, and he lives just a few miles from me, and I did not know this. Uh, a couple months ago, I put out a, uh, a tweet that said, hey, I'm looking for people to come on my show to talk about automation. And um, he volunteered, and over the course of our conversation, we both realized we live just a few miles apart. Um, so that's pretty cool, actually. He's gonna, <laughs> we're gonna hang out uh, over the over the holidays here. Um, <clears throat> so, Mike, uh, before we get started, um, because we're pre-recording this and it's eight thirty at night, uh, <laughs> I need to know what beer that you are drinking. What is that? Uh, I have a carbon four block party. Yeah, what is that? Like an IPA? Uh, amber ale. Oh, it's an amber. Is it good? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a good, what I would call a good daily drinker. Yeah, I think that's a Wisconsin brewery. Is that true? I think it's in. I think they're in Madison. That is correct. That is correct. I uh, I am drinking. I also have a Wisconsin brewery uh, in my hand. This is a. Uh, a proper porter oh, uh, from, front. yeah, from Lakefront, exactly. And they're, I don't know how proper it is. It's um, <laughs> like they have something like in resembling the uh, the uh, yeah. British, British flag on there. Yeah. Um, it's a good porter. I wouldn't call it, you know, a proper porter, but it's good. <laughs> it's good. It's all that matters. Yeah. So, yeah, so go ahead. Tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself. So, I guess high level, the the nitty gritties. I have a, uh, I would, it's a twelve years, uh, right? Twelve years, roughly twelve years of enterprise networking experience, and about three and a half years of what I guess I would call automation scripting coding experience. So I'm a I'm pretty new in that in that journey. Um, so. Yeah, I, uh, I manage a network and telecom team for an insurance company. Um, myself and predominantly one other gentleman do all of the, like the scripting automation. We're trying to get one of, the, one of our other engineers is kind of coming up pretty quick and learning it pretty well. And then I have a new hire that's starting in two, two or three weeks that has done some pretty nice scripts for us as well. He was an intern and he's coming back full time. So. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Nice. So you were a network engineer first, right? Yeah. Uh, it's still have to still have to do the networking work, still keep the lights on that sort of thing. But, um, yeah, I spent of that of those 12 years, like I said, probably nine of them at a different company where you didn't even hear the word automation. Didn't even know, didn't even hear the word Python, anything like that. So, yeah. <laughs> So you say um, you you still are a network engineer. You have to keep the lights on. That means yep. that this automation thing is something you're doing on top of your regular duties. Yes, that we yeah we are um, we've actually 
we started getting into it and we can kind of get into the nitty gritty here in a little bit, but uh, we've definitely, we're, we're a smaller team. We have, um, myself included, we have one, two, three, four, four, engine, four network engineers. And then as, at the first of the year, networking and telecom joined. So we have one telecom engineer and then the third engineer is kind of going to bridge the gap. So we're not, a, the, the company's not massive, but it's big enough and busy enough that we quickly realized that even the day-to-day -day stuff, we need to have a better way of doing it. So we're automating out of necessity. Out of necessity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that, um, that is frequently the impetus to automation is necessity, right? Yep. Cool. So you said you're, you're relatively new. You're, you're three years in about yep. doing this. Yep. Um, so, so what uh, we'll just, I'll just ask a very broad question first. I know we have like a little list and a document um, sure. on the side here, but uh, for you personally, I, I mean, there's a whole variety of challenges. So what, if you could talk a little bit about the kinds of challenges that you've run into um, that, I mean, I, I think I would love to hear that. <laughs> sure. Um, so there's, well, there, there's a few different ones. Some of them, some of them are straight technical and some of them are more of a operational organizational thing. The straight technical thing is taking somebody that has no coding, no understanding of scripting whatsoever, and then throwing API documentation at them. And then you're just supposed to figure this out, like post, like all these API interactions, or you start looking at, basic Python scripts, there's a, there's a learning curve there. Uh, granted, Python makes it a little bit easier, but there's a pretty steep learning curve there, especially when you get into some vendors' questionable documentation, which is, quite frankly, as me and the other gentlemen have joked, is written for, by developers for developers. So you have this non-developer guy reading this documentation going, well, how do I, how do I, like, they make some assumptions that you understand, and then they just throw like a, like a curl statement at you and be like, okay, I got to, all right, so you're piecing it together. So there's that technical learning curve there, which I think comes with any learning any language, I would assume. But yeah. that was that was relatively new for us, right? Well, what do you mean by developers for developers? Well, I, I mean, it would almost be like, good example would be, imagine, imagine stripping out some of the first chunks of the white paper, like a Cisco white paper that talks about configuring BGP like with the diagram and you just threw the code at them and said, all right, here's how you configure BGP, you know, and they just gave you a big long snippet of the configuration. You oh, with, with, no, with yeah. like no explanatory text. Correct. Said, yep. Oh, here it is. It's obvious. Yep. That's, that's kind of how it was in a way with, especially it was more, more with some, um, with some vendors than others. Like I said, some vendors documentation was a little bit better that, that we ran into or that I ran into, I guess I would say. But it still is one of those things where they're making some assumptions that you have a basic understanding of, like, how, how, are, you going to, how are you going to do this post? How are you going to craft this payload for your post for the API? Or if you're looking over for a certain string or something, how are you going to craft that get so that you know what you're looking for? And like I said, a lot of times they just kind of throw a curl statement at you and then you're trying to piece it back together. I mean, not to get too far off topic, but Postman was extremely helpful in that and that it kind of broke the code out for you. So you could be like, well, here's this thing I want to do. Give it to me in Python. Oh, now you can start piecing together. That's where I put this. This is where I put that, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, maybe, Postman's a great tool. Yeah, yeah. So for it. those of you who are watching um, who don't know what Postman is, um, so you, you can get it on Chrome. Uh, there's actually a couple different things called Postman that are on Chrome, but there's, there's one of them that is the actual Postman. And um, it's a way for you to act. So when you interact with a website uh, in your browser, um, it does HTTP posts and, and it does HTTP gets. And when you do those things, um, you get responses back. And those responses contain the information uh, for the browser to render the response in your window. Um, well, with an, a with, with an API, um, that response is frequently just some kind of plain text 
um, like in XML or JSON or, or YAML format. And with Postman, um, you can actually interact with an API and view that plain text in a much more intuitive and easy way than you can with uh, an actual browser um, or doing it from the command line. Actually, I will say that it's way better than doing it from the command line. <laughs> So if you want to, and, and often uh, the reason why he brought Postman up, I'm assuming uh, that you, uh, this is the reason, actually I'll, I'll leave it to you to explain it, but I, I'm, I'm assuming that the reason why you, you brought this up is because sometimes, like you just said, the documentation isn't always clear or it's not documented and you can um, go into Postman and you can send a request um, and then it'll tell you, oh, you did it wrong and then you can sort of figure it out and then and then you get a response and then from that response you can sort of parse it out yeah right? you, so you know how to parse it out I yep say. The, there's the, the two aspects the, the biggest aspects are the feedback you get from the api like you mentioned and the second part is if there are some extra attributes that you want to send in your command but you're getting them crafted correctly so i we, I, for a lot, a lot of the time, will use Postman to help me craft my Python code. Because at the end of the day, I want it in CLI format. The, what I'm trying to do with this, I want it to spit it back out in a certain way. Yeah. Um, like, it, I, I, like I want to use that JSON, convert it to some text, loop through it to get the keys, what I, whatever I'm trying to get, whatever it may be. And then one nice thing about Postman is if you can craft it well enough with what you're trying to send and it works, like it spits it back out in correctly, you can, with a couple clicks, you can get the full Python code right there. So you can see exactly how the request was crafted in that code and it goes well beyond Python. I don't even know how many languages are in there. There's a ton of them for whatever you're trying to write in. And it's just, boom, there's the code that it was used right there. So you can be either, either you can just copy and paste that directly, or you can use it as kind of a template for what you're trying to get. Yeah, like a guideline. Yep, yep. Like you, like you cut, paste, and, and then you, you tailor. Yep, yep. But what I like about um, Postman is like, uh, I don't like people do not understand how feature rich this tool is. You can actually, um, rec like you can actually record what you're doing and you can set up these, sort of um, within Postman, you can set up, if you will, a script where um, it authenticates, it runs a command, it does like a, a whole sequence of steps that you can preset so that you can get to a point where that you need to be at in order in order to do what you want to do. Um, that's, that's another thing. That, that's what I like about Postman. When I was using Postman to do this, um, particularly with, with the Juniper API, um, I'm, I'm going to say I work for Juniper and I'll say right now that... Uh, Juniper's documentation is written by developers for developers. <laughs> um, at least parts of it are, especially the netconf bits. Uh, sure. It's I I found Postman to be absolutely invaluable um, for for learning how to interact with with that API and, and learning totally how to agree. yeah how to craft things and how to you know. You can yep. sequence things, you can do all that stuff. Yeah, and then the setting environmental variables. So if you're hopping between APIs, you can preset your your authentication keys and whatnot. Or if there's something specific that API, like uh, something that identifies you or identifies your organization to it, you can just pop between them and set all those variables right there. So that when you're going from API A to API B, you just hit over that environment and all of your stuff's preset. You can just craft whatever you're trying to get and you don't have to worry about all that other stuff like how you're authenticating what's your secret all that kind of stuff so yeah cool so uh, anyways sorry um, yeah no so fun so, yeah fun segue so there's that there's the technical aspect of it for there that's been one challenge and then at least for us there's been this challenge of kind of getting the organization on board so we have over 200 in-house actual developers at our organization that write is that write code for our core business function. So now you have this group of like the tech nerds coming and saying, Hey, we're doing all this scripting and this automation kind of doing this development work. No, we're not writing anything that anybody's seeing, you know, we're not writing front ends or anything like that. So the organization was kind of, has been kind of like, wait, a, like for a little while, initially they're like, wait a second. They weren't expecting, I don't, I don't, I think there were portions of it that weren't expecting this to come from the, the tech area of it, you know? So there's a little bit of a, 
and that they got over that the organization seemed to get over that quick so that wasn't that big of a hurdle but there was a little bit of a wait a minute you wrote a script to do what so there's there's been a little bit of that yeah yeah i can imagine um so i mean what are some of the for so i'm sure you've met a lot of resistance um in in your efforts to to make, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because I've, I've lived through this multiple times, right? Um, there's always resistance uh, from, from multiple things, right? There's resistance from other groups in your organization, the server guys, the storage guys, the security guys, the uh, even management, right? And, um, and then you have your own guys that often, you know, uh, resist, right? They just, um, they just don't see their job as involving um, writing a Python script. Like they look at that and they think, I don't want to be a developer. Um, even though, honestly, I've, I've been a professional software engineer on and off my whole career. I don't think Python really counts. Um, you can write Python correctly. <laughs> you can be a, I mean, you can engineer Python. Hey, what about Netbox, it. man? Netbox is a great, like, isn't that all Python? I'm pretty sure that's all Python. Net, Net Netbox is pretty dope. I'm not going to yeah. lie. You can write great applications <laughs> in Python. But, you know, you could write py great applications in Tickle, too. I, I just yeah. mean, you know, there's there's a whole, you know, some of the books on the on the back here, which I, you know, occasionally. I wouldn't, as a, as, as a person that's done scripting in Python, I wouldn't equate myself to a developer by any means, nor is anybody that is doing this on no, my no. team or off of it. No, but to your point, it's a, it's a different, those, those are two different things. They are, they are so. two different things. Uh, you're, you don't have to be a software engineer to be into automation. I guess that's what I'm saying, but you are writing code and that's, you know, there, there's a distinction there, I guess. Well, and it's funny, you, you brought up the idea of, um, you know, off software engineer off and on and whether or not your team would be on board or members of your team would be on board with, with writing code, you know, like yep. we're network guys, we're not, we're not coders. The interesting thing that I have found, at least with the, 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 the members of my team that are doing it is, especially for me and, and um, my buddy, Chris, that's on the team, we actually found it's, it's kind of reignited that, that kind of excitement and passion that we had for networking when we first got into it. And we're to the point now, and we're not a, like I said, we're not a massive organization with this huge MPLS network or anything like that, right? But when we look, start looking at, okay, we got, like when you start looking at traditional networking, like I have to configure this BGP peering or this peering or whatever it may be, it's like, I have to configure this VLAN, okay. It's mundane. But then you start being like, wait a minute, I can do this in, with, a, with Python? And it, the, it instantly became more exciting again. Like that, it, 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 it was the exact opposite of not wanting to do that. It was like, no, that, that's awesome. Let, let me do that. It's making my job, I don't want to say exciting again, because it's not, it's not a boring job by any stretch, but it definitely adds some, some fun to it. Yeah. Well, hey, it's a new way of interacting with the systems that are under your purview, right? Yep. Like you got to, and, and, I love that, dude. Uh, that's, I, I mean, that's the core of what makes us nerds is, you know, like we, we like, you know, my dad, uh, he can talk about every kind of engine in the world, <laughs> motorcycle, boat, and car, truck, and he can tell you everything about every engine. I don't know anything about that stuff and, <laughs> and how to fix them, how to interact with them. Like he, he's, he gets excited talking about, you know, when he first started out, like every engine had to be pulled out and taken apart and the parts mm -hmm. oiled and cleaned and organized. And now you can put a computer in and there's a bunch of problems that you can fix just by attaching a computer and not turning a single bolt, Yep. you know, and that, and he gets totally nerded out by that. So it, new ways of interacting with the systems that you love is always going to light a fire. Right. And yep. I, so if you're watching this, um, this is, this is a key take, 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 this is the first key takeaway from this conversation is, uh, you know, um, the thing that, especially network engineers, the thing that you love about being a network engineer is the uncertainty and the complexity and learning new stuff all the time. Um, when it comes to automation, you don't have to be a full on software engineer. This is just another thing that you can pull in and make it part of your skill set, And it's a new kind of thing that can, that can keep that fire going. 
for, for what you do. So um, getting, getting back on topic though. So uh, mm -hmm. the challenges, right? The, uh, sure. the other, the other silos, your own team uh, management, like let's, hey, let's talk more about that because when we kicked, before we started recording, you had some good stories. Yeah. So, oh boy, which ones are there? So really, I guess the, the, the key, I don't the key organizational challenge that we have right now with, with kind of management and management slash security is they have to do their job as well. Like talking about security, right? So we, and when I say we, I'm talking about specifically, like more specifically my team, that work directly with me, but some of this spills over into some of the other tech teams like infrastructure guys and whatnot that are also doing some coding. We legitimately maybe want to sprint in some ways from their purview before we can walk. Right. So yep. what are some things that are, are good security? What are some things that security would be worried about when it comes to what your script, you know, when it comes to what you're doing, right. Some of the, some of the things are simple, like, are you passing passwords in your script? Like, how are you, how are you writing this code? You know, are you, every time you need to authenticate, are you just hard coding your AD password into this thing so you can authenticate? You know, what do you, maybe some people, I don't know. Like, so they have, they have their due diligence that they need to do without a doubt, right? Um, so there's that. And if it went, you know, if you have, if you have a group of, if you have this, all of a sudden this insurgence of, tech folk who let's let's just let's call a spade a spade legitimately aren't developers so they may not know we may not know what we don't know as non-developers right now maybe python's a little bit safer but at the end of the day it also depends on the gear you're touching right you could you could theoretically nuke some equipment and you could take things down and break things it could be very bad you could do that yeah, from the cli not as well theoretically you can do that. <laughs> you, yeah and you that might. is not a theory you can do that <laughs> this yeah, is true sure. Right. But you, but so there's that aspect of it. And the challenge is, is how do you, how do you foster that? How do you acknowledge and foster that ability and to do these things with these talented engineers you have that want to do this while still making sure that you're covering your bases from what you're responsible for from a, like from a security perspective. So there's, there's some fair challenges that I think probably a lot of organizations or at least any organization that would take security seriously would have to face and they have to, they have to determine how they're going to do that. We're going through some of that right now. How do, how do we do this? So, so do you think it's like, um, I'll say, I'll, I'll frame it this way. Do you think it's a little bit, that because they also don't know they like if you're if you're new to automation and you're the guy that sort of you know as you said you're you're the insurgent right those that's that was the word you insurgency is the word you used you're the insurgent um and 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 so in this scenario the the other organizations they haven't gone down this path in a in a serious way or or in a way where you know your intention is to change the way your company or at least your team operates right yep. And, but you can't do that unless you get other silos to do that. Yep. And because you're the insurgent, the uncertainty is even greater on their side. So you have uncertainty on their side, right? And then I guess the flip side to that is, um, or what's directly related to that, like it's, it's sort of, you can't separate these two things, is that um, there's like a devil, the devil you know sort of situation here where, um, the old way they know, right? They, and because they know it so well, when, when unexpected things happen, they know how to circle around it. But here you're doing something new and, and now they don't know how to circle around it. So do you, do you, I mean, do you think there's a little bit of that going on? So two parts to that answer. I think in my previous job, there would have been more of that being a true unknown. Like literally they don't understand what they, they would have, they wouldn't have had any understanding. Even if we were doing the level of coding that we're doing right now, they wouldn't have had an understanding of what you're doing. What, at least that was my, that's how I would have taken that. Right. Um, we're lucky where I'm at right now in that we have members of the security team who are, who have transitioned from developer roles to the security roles. So you have actual developers that are on your security team. Um, oh, that's kind of awesome. Which is, really cool 
um, from this from from the paradigm of automation, right? It's really cool from from when looking at it from there, right? So I think the challenge now isn't they wouldn't understand what they're doing, it understand what we're doing. It's making sure the guardrails are in place so that they know what we're doing. And if we kick something off, they can see, oh, this thing kicked this off and touched these pieces of equipment. Because there's the compliance aspect of all this. Like let's not let's not kid ourselves. There's the, we we have to maintain compliance. They have responsibilities, especially like with PCI and whatnot, to maintain certain things and keep certain logs and be able to track certain things. So they can't just pull the pull the reins like pull the rail let, let the track no let the train run wherever it's going to run. They have we have to figure out a way. So I think more for us right now it's how do we facilitate you doing this while we can still make sure that we're covering our our security bases. Oh, for sure. I mean. I don't think people understand. Um, so this is, I think this, I relate to this very strongly because before I went to the vendor side, the last company I worked at was a financial company and people, if, unless you've worked in a, fin especially a financial company that crosses state lines, um, that's, that's national in, in nature, how much compliant compliancy stuff there is. Like it's, it's insane. Like it, like we were under audit, our, our company, Mark, and was doing nothing wrong. I mean, we were doing nothing wrong. We had no incidents. Like I need, well, we, I mean, we had incidents sometimes, but um, even when things were calm and there was nothing bad happening, we were being audited half of the year, every year. <laughs> I mean, from organizations you never heard of, like, like, what is this? Like five letter agency I've never heard of. And they come in and they're like, are you doing all these things? And can we, you know, run scans on your network internally? It was, it was crazy. Um, so that's, I mean, I can imagine, I can't imagine actually, that must be insane for your security guys. Yep. Yeah. And there's the, and the, the, the regulations and then in turn are, for your management. Yeah. The, and the regulations are constantly shifting. And as, as you probably know, security regulations aren't always if and I might be putting that mildly, aren't necessarily written black and white. There's a gray area that you could think you're compliant. And then if the auditor comes in and that data decides to think you're reads it a different way, well, all of a sudden now you're not compliant. And so it's, it's a nightmare. So. Um, that, that's got to create a weird conflict between management then, because, you know, I, and I say this in a way, I, well, let me reframe that. Um, this is a particular challenge then because, you know, the management's got to listen to security and they want to listen to you. And I guess shifting the focus from security and management, they have to like, they have to figure out what to do and, and who to listen to. Right. And if they have their security guys saying, no, we got to shut it down or just, we can't do this. And then they say, well, okay, well, automation is not going to happen. Or, you know, you're going to have to figure out, we're just not going to do it this way. Um, but they, they, they do it in a very broad way. How do you turn management around from, from being like a, a yay, nay, a yay or nay gatekeeper sort of position to being, well, let's, let's, let's make this happen and solve the problems we need to solve to make it happen along the way. Like, how do you get management engaged? And, and I don't know if you've, if you, if you've solved that problem, but um, I imagine you must be going through that. Um, yeah, we are going through it. And there's probably two, two primary, I guess, avenues that, that facilitate that. Number one is even management when they, at whatever level, C level, whatever level, anytime they are listening to any technical presentation by anybody or any sort of technical talk, automation orchestration are coming up constantly. I mean, along with other terms like cloud, multi-cloud, all that kind of stuff, right? SDN. Yeah. Yep. Another good one. Um, so they're constantly hearing this and they're constantly, so this, this isn't something that's, that's just being brought up and then you can sweep it away. Every organ, every vendor you bring in right now, um, even if it's a new vendor for a sales pitch or whatnot, automation, orchestration, APIs, that whole idea that whole concept is part of every presentation. So this is something that's always there, right? So there's that. 
that makes that makes bringing the conversation up easy because the conversation is constantly being brought up yep the second part that i've noticed that that kind of has helped a ton is showing like giving examples of where automation even if it's not like i think um there's that what is it that five step that I think, and even you, I don't remember, it was an NRE thing or whatnot, the five steps of automation, like you're doing everything manually and it's fully autonomous, right? Yeah. No matter yeah. where you are in that scale. Yeah. Yeah. I help write that. I know yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Juniper has this um, uh, five step uh, automation, five step guide where uh, on the first step, um, there's your, your, you're not doing any automation. On the second step, you're writing scripts, but not really in a, in a disciplined or controlled manner. And then, uh, and then it works its way up to the fifth step, which is like, you know, um, a very long time ago, I said, it's, it's the land of unicorns, uh, <laughs> farting candy and beer. And it's like, everything is awesome. Yes. Yeah. Um, and everything is automated and all that yep. stuff. Yeah. So yep. even, even if, so everything that we write right now is manually kicked off. And it does something that you're interacting with. And we're slowly taking aspects of that and trying to, even from not even within our group, but other groups, and trying to make it where it is kind of a self doing, self realizing thing. Like this will happen if this happens. It's event driven, basically. But even if it is something that is, I'm gonna walk up to my computer, I'm gonna call this Python script. And yes, I'm going to directly interact with it as it makes a change, or I'm going to tell it, yep, yep, that's okay, right? When you can go back to when you can go back to to management and say, hey, when you guys request a new data network in the data center, something that used to take, I don't know, a day to to configure, a hat like three quarters of a day to configure, now it takes us 10 minutes. Oh, and by the way, it's completely repeatable. We don't have the same problems where, oh, you forgot to apply that to this router. Oh, oh you didn't put that, that VLAN on this switch. It's gone. Like it's one thing when you're, when you're touching three, dev three devices, when you're making these configuration changes on three devices. When you're adding this and you're touching 60 devices plus, like I said, we're, we're not that big. So there's, it, it grows well beyond that. But when you're touching 60 devices to make this thing happen, and more often than not, it's not, I need one new network. It's, I need these four new networks. Well, okay, talk, I'll, I'll let you know in three days when this is done, you know, because I have to log into all these pieces of equipment. Even if you pre, pre stage the cut code, you're still, there's ways around it, but it's still, it's not a good process. So when you no. can start taking these things like that, and even if they don't care, I don't want to say they don't care, but sitting them down in front of this and being like, Oh, check this cool thing out. It, it, you know, it's eh, okay. ROI on this is time. Like this is, this time is a precious commodity. How quickly can you turn this around? Well, you know what? We're no longer bottlenecking this 15 minutes and our stuff is done. Okay. On to the next thing. So I think that has gone a long way in. It'd be one thing if we weren't doing anything internally with this. So even if this automation thing was coming up and they're like, oh, yeah, okay, that's cool. But when you have multiple groups that are showing what they've done with automation within the confines of their own equipment and their own, like their own silo, and now you start having them saying, well, I want to talk to this silo and I want to talk to this silo and they're going to talk to this one and everything starts kind of intertwining that's where you start where even if they don't get that's it, where the start, magic starts yeah well that's where you start seeing them going oh okay and even if you don't have even if even if you can't walk into to management and say hey if you give us the okay we have this done tomorrow right even if there is some look we're gonna hit some bumps in the road to get this but this is what our goal is and this is what an achievable goal is and they go wait a minute that makes total sense why wouldn't we do that you know it, it makes the conversation a little bit easier. The security concerns and the other, all the other concerns of the how and the standards and all that, those are, those, those are a constant. Those are always going to, going to exist. But if you, can, if you show value to these other things, working on those becomes easy. Well, that becomes easy, but it becomes doable. It becomes a, a thing that, is, that, that warrants value, I guess I would say. As a manager, for, for people on your own team, is this something where you tell them, you know, you're either on the bus or you're in front of it, 
or is or is this something where you want to foster a sense of um we'll say you know participation and belonging like they like they're part of the process you know they're uh, how do you, how do you, uh, or is there a mix, you know, depending on personality, like how, how do you, what are the challenges with your own team and how do you, <laughs> I, I don't want, this sounded terrible. Like, you know, how do you, how do you punish them if they don't comply? <laughs> but like, you know, how do you, how do you sell them and how do you, you know, how do you bring them along? Um, so part of that comes back to basics of who do you have on your staff, right? It, it, that conversation is the same conversation you have with, stages of engineers you would have whether whatever the the level is right if you have an entry-level engineer you're not going to give them the you know your the reworking of your bgp edge it's just it's not there right they're they're not there maybe you have them shadow well this comes with the same thing i'm not going to actively force i'm not going to really actively force any member of my team to do automation i would hope that they would see the benefits in the things that we automate and i know they can use those tools and benefit from them. So there's, you, you kind of want them, you want them to want to come along on the, the path, so to speak, right? But it's also not for everyone. And there's also roles that are on a team that don't really require you knowing how to code. So um, I'm fortunate in that every member of my team on some level is open to the idea of automation. Some of them are at the very, very entry level, like the, the hello world dot pie, like you could maybe get them there. And some of them like, like my buddy Chris have, have done a lot of, or uh, have done a lot of the heavy lifting on some, on a lot of the more complex stuff that we did because he's all in on it, you know? So we have the entire gamut of, of, of those people so it that i'm fortunate that's the easy part and then when you do have somebody that wants to like a more entry level you just encourage it like oh hey i i, I was messing around a little bit and i wrote this script to get this information from the switch awesome can you now take that information and also see if you can pull this and pair the two right so you, you do things that to maybe foster have, and grow. Yeah, maybe they don't have a functional, like you're not asking them to do something that's going to functionally change how you're doing something at work, but it's going to it's going to get them along the path and get them excited about it, which is only going to help down the road when they actually, when you actually do hand them a project, you're like, hey man, there's no reason we should be doing this by hand. Figure out a way to, how can we automate this? 